Uh, it's a very pleasure for me and an honor to introduce my group, then uh, Alexander, Belen, Claudia, and our supervisor, Armin. Okay, our project is uh, Project 4 and uh, is uh, Increment Visual Feedback Facilities Learning. Of course, some evidence from literature. Then, uh, feedback visual and haptic of one's motor performance can have a strong influence over the motor system and may serve as potent signal for remapping sensory motor circuits during skill acquisition. In the other hand, in this paper, uh, the visual uh, motor interaction has been largely studied uh, from uh, proximal arm control. In this paper, Krakauer and the colleague proposes that are mediated by a cortical and a subcortical network, including frontoparietal cortex, cerebellum, and basal glandia. Uh, Sale, and uh, this is our uh, most inspiration, is, uh, uh, and the colleague have exploited uh, this concept by showing that exaggerating haptic movement error using robots during training can accelerate motor learning, which may be potentially applicable for retraining skill in patients with neuro neurological impairment. So our years based on uh, sensory motor alteration increases neuronal activation in the permatox cortex. So Tunic and Elter said that uh, has, has some, some uh, examples like if they 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 do uh, an experiment that they they change the way of the hand is performing so you have uh, a hand and you have a virtual reality where your finger is moving in a different way there are two they have two different experiments so one way is like you move uh, like say this finger and the, the in virtual reality you are moving this finger so the the subject has to learn that this change has is happening in the virtual reality. So this in, this implies uh, different premotor cortex and more activation in that zones. So to, at the end, Tunic suggests that this can help in the rehabilitation environment. So uh, our hypothesis is, is if uh, the incurring, incurring visual feedback, so incurring uh, visual mapping, activates more the virtual mo premotor cortex, does it facilitate that, uh, the learning of new sensory associations? So uh, to do that, we have this setup based on uh, RGS. So what we have is we are going to avoid the Kinect and uh, the gloves. Instead of that, we are going to have the Mio to trace the, the movement of the subject. And then instead of the screen, we are going to involve more the subject in a virtual reality. So here comes the methods. All right, so with regards to our methods, we, uh, we decided to have two groups to test, and both of them were supposed to perform a motor task. Uh, and the difference between the two groups were that the one mapping was congruent mapping, one to one mapping, and the other one was distorted, to check the, whether the hypothesis was right uh, or not. And then we had the healthy male subjects, right-handed, between 25, 35 years old. And so within the virtual reality, we designed a task, well, which was to move a figure towards a zone. There were three zones. And every figure, figure had a color associated with a single zone, right? So every shape was associated with a single zone as well. And the rule changed every 100 trials. So the direct rail learning was the color that the color belonged to a zone. And the implicit learning was that the shape belonged to a zone as well. So uh, with regard to the probabilities of the distribution, uh, we had zone A, B, and C, and we had three colors, blue, green, and red, and then three shapes, square, cross, and circle. And uh, there were 90% of the possibility that the color will establish the rule of getting towards the correct zone, right? And 70% as regards to the shape. Yeah. We'll play the video so that you can see. Just play it here or? Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, we'll it. Uh, from here. 
performance of one subject. Object within the three zones according to the rule that the subject was supposed to. Here's the subject. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it's doing a presentation. Come over. Yes. You guys can win it a bit disorderly. Yeah. Tranquilo. One at a time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, well, as, as you saw, the, the task mainly is you have to find out which is the rule that really, that, uh, or the logic behind the game. So you, uh, so you increase the number of correct movements that you do, right? The problem is that we are playing with a lot of probabilities. So we have different shapes and they, sometimes the square is blue, sometimes the square is red, and sometimes if you figure out that the rule of the color is the one that is associated to, with the area, still we have uncertainty in the audit, uh, sound feedback, because 90% of the times that you will do the correct movement, you will receive the wrong uh, sound, right? So this is a bit confusing. Uh, what we did is we had 300 trials separated in three blocks, so uh, three blocks of 100 trials, uh, where also we had interleaved trials in which everything became uh, black and white, okay? So we were showing gray shapes, so the color is not a, uh, any, doesn't give you any information. Now, and you have to find out the association between the color and the shape. That was this implicit uh, learning that we were, talk we were talking about before. Okay, so uh, now... Okay. Okay. So we we didn't have time at the end to complete the experiment. So we just uh, developed the scenario and then tested some subjects to improve it. So the task it's they are able to solve it. And then we tested some subjects from group one, but we didn't go for group two yet. So what we expect to see in this experiment is that uh, subjects will learn faster uh, the new rule because, the, well, okay, I didn't explain something, sorry, that is very important, that is, we are changing the rule every 100 trials, which means that, let's say, color red has to go to zone one in the first block, but in the second block, it will be changed, so we don't know where color red is going, and we have to find it out again, okay, and subjects don't know that we are changing the rule, and at which point we are changing the rule. So, uh, we expect that in the, in the, between the first block and the second block, during the second block, which is the rule, and probably subjects will, will have more resistance or less flexibility to learn the new rule, okay? But after realizing that the rule changed for the third block, probably they will learn faster the new rule, because they accept that, okay, this can change, okay? We expect to see this, which means that in the second and third block, we will see faster learning of the new rule. And 
okay, this our second idea or hypothesis would be that if, as we said before, the ventral premotor cortex has higher activation in the case of receiving an, an incongruent visual feedback of our action, this would mean that probably we can learn sensory motor associations or it facilitates learning. Uh, sensory motor association. So they will be able to learn this association, this associations and perform better in the gray trials than the other group. So these are the results we got. We tested two subjects and I think uh, they make sense kind of. I, I explained you now at the first column we have the subject one and second column we have subject two. Okay. So we see that on the top, we are plotting the percentage of correct movements. Ah, okay. It's difficult to extrapolate. Yeah. <laughs> I see the projection, but no, on the symbol. We can mouse. This thing is not really working, I think. Oh. It is. No, you have working. to plug it in. Oh, yeah, the USB, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I'll just get rid of that. I have to close here. Yeah, close. Yeah, close, close. Close. Okay, so this yeah, is subject sport. one, yeah. this is subject two. Here we are plotting the percentage of correct movements in uh, Maybe windows. turn off the sound on the computer. Yes. Okay, well, you hear, you hear me. Yeah. Yeah. In windows of five trials. So we took five trials and we, said, we saw how many here were correct movements, okay? And then we plot it, we see that this subject is kind of not following any, any pattern, okay? It looks like random, he's not learning anything. Actually, but Brian, if you don't speak on the microphone, it will not be recorded. Yeah. Ah, okay. So well, in this case, we see that the subject is not learning, it seems. But in this case, we see that we are changing the rule here. In the trial 10, well, that would be trial 100, because these are like, sorry, the window of trials is 10, it's not 5, so we are doing the, the percentage of every 10 trials. And this would be the 20, okay, the 200. So we see a drop every time we, a drop in performance every time we change the rule, which makes sense, right? And then he's learning again that there is a new rule. And we see, okay, this is just one subject, of course, and we need to test more subjects and, and take more data, of course, but we would say that here he's more able to, to realize that, okay, the change, the, the rule changed, so I'm learning it faster than compared to this one, where he didn't expect. So here we are uh, plotting the percentage of correct movements for gray trials. Okay. And we see that this subject that was performing kind of random and didn't learn the, the rule of color associated to, to the zone. Here, uh, the, the cor like, uh, doing the correct movement for a gray uh, shape should be, the chance should be around 0 0.3, right? Because you have three zones, a shape, you don't know any color. But he was above it for two blocks, while the other one, the other subject, was not above it. So this subject performed much better for the gray shapes, and this subject performed much better for, for the colored stripes, okay? This very, very, a bit strange, but we have kind of an explanation for this. <coughs> so, but no, Berlin, if you go to your result, yeah. you say, so Pier Paolo was doing the experiment there, and it was random, you said. Here, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you could also argue, when you have the transitions, yes. you actually see an improvement, but it collapses again, you see? Uh, so Here, both a 10 instance? and a 20, and a 20 actually see an improvement, mm. right? Yeah. So, yeah. Is it possible? Is it possible that uh, something went wrong with with the presentation method, and the sense of having a rule at all got lost at trial 15, let's say, or just before? Is that possible? Uh, I don't think it's possible that something went wrong with the presentation because we were also in front and we were seeing how he was okay. performing, and I remember how he was performing, and mm -hmm. I think. I think he, the problem is that 90% uh, of the times you do the correct movement and okay, you hear the sound, so everything is fine. But 10% of the times, the, it's, not, it's, it's not giving you the proper feedback. Mm -hmm. So do the correct movement and I fell. So what's happening here? And we saw a lot of studies saying, why? No? Saying aloud, why? Because 
We would accept that the rule is not strict, right? Okay, so yeah. So I think this could be a confused, could, could have confused a lot. Well, I think I have an explanation for these results, but I would like to hear your explanation first. Okay. So. <laughs> Great. Okay. So yeah, I think this. I I keep on and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So for the conclusions, okay. what do, did we learn? Let's say, uh, we see what I just explained that the uncertainty of the audio feedback that is what tells you if you you did the correct movement or not is making that really really complex. Um, the interaction with the system could be improved because some subjects told us that it wasn't comfortable at all to use the admin interface. Uh, so we would go for, for the kinect instead. Uh, next, uh, we think that some subjects misunderstood the grade trials and this is our fault because we wanted to put everything in, in black and white. So you understand that the color is not a, a clue anymore. It's not giving you any information. But what we did is just to put the gray shape which means that some, some studies probably understood that it was a, this was a new color that had another rule or... Uh, so this should be changed. Uh, also, uh, we saw that most of the subjects had too much time to think and we want this to be a very automatic movement. Uh, and some of them, like, we, we did, like, this trial had five, we, we were giving five seconds and it was enough for subjects to look at the shape and think, okay, so square, red, mm, and we don't want this. We just want to trigger the action that they feel that is the correct one. Uh, okay, and that's all. That's all our interventions. Very good. Right. Any questions, questions from the audience? Now it's up to you guys to pose questions, right? Very, very tough question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Giovanni, you're going to explain how this works? Well, uh, of course you cannot, you cannot have any explanation for two subjects in a set, yeah. so it's just a, a wild well, speculation. But in a sense. But, well, and one course. of them being Pier Paolo, right? <laughs> Who <made it> up? <laughs> of course, and the other it was one random <laughs> again. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, no, in a sense, well, we, uh, uh, a few days ago we had this lecture by Etienne Coughlin explaining this theory on how you, let's say, you extract rules, you try to figure out which is the role of the game. Mm -hmm. And it seems that, well, in a sense, this uh, the second subject, uh, uh, so, it, so in your game, you have uh, colors and you have shapes. Yeah. So you could argue that yeah. the, the, the rule depends on, on color or on shape. You yeah. don't know at the beginning. Sure. So it looks like the second subject correctly argued that the rule depended on color, let's say, but then didn't pay too much attention to the shape anymore. Yeah. Okay. This means that in gray, so in gray trials, he had no cue basically, so it, yeah. it got random. Whereas the second one, maybe incorrectly argued that there was a, okay, let's say like double rule that depended both conjunctively on mm -hmm. shapes and colors. Yeah. <coughs> But then it had an advantage when when there was also mm -hmm. shape involved. Yeah, sure. so may, may I ask you a question on a question? Just the two subjects were uh, knowledgeable about the procedure? No, they, no. Just don't, they just know that they have to move the figures somewhere. Mm -hmm. and so the both they think subjects it's a yeah. Yeah. Well, no of culture course. about the well. army or the about subjects. Uh, no, they, they no, have the they Which one? I think they have to debrief hey, the both. subject as well. Both. Yeah. Both okay. have, yes. I, I completely yes, agree, yeah. <laughs> No, well, because there is a difference in the subject. It could be uh, understood if based on the knowledge the subject has. No, but both of them feel uncomfortable when they are doing the, the, their meal. Both of them feel like, what is doing? It's, it's yeah, they fault, were you know, uncoordinated. You no, could but see it very well. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, no, both of them used their meal before. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, but anyway, it, on top of this, well, of course this yeah. is... Um, this is statistically not significant in any yeah, respect. Yeah, it no. it, sure, was, sure. Ju it was just to, to try to illustrate what, uh, so which, which uh, let's say, computationally oriented view you could have to generate some hypothesis. So you mm. could generate some hypothesis on how uh, people would behave in that task. And so one hypothesis could be, could be that people try to extract a rule based on one single queue, the other hypothesis on both queues. And so these hypotheses generate different predictions, and maybe you can look into the data. And of course, if you want to do an analysis here, I would also suggest to do it on trial by trial analysis, so you really track the yeah. the, the behavior, well, mm -hmm. the behavior over time, rather than mm. uh, let's say marginalized or uh, 
yeah, yeah. other agents. Well, it would also be interesting to look at the first year trials because you could imagine that these differences in strategy are just due, due to some fluctuations in the trials. That, for instance, um, one subject might might have had the idea that they got the rule when the, for instance, was, was in a gray image. Yeah. Okay. So these might be things you can now manipulate. That means you have some variability in the early trials, which you try to bias the subject to go on one rule or the other, okay, and yeah, then see yeah. if you have these different patterns. But I think it's a really great paradigm, and I think it would be good to also debrief the subject that they declare to you what they think the rule is, mm -hmm. ah, yeah. so then you can interpret maybe also a little bit better yeah, what, yeah. what you we, see. We did that, and I right. think also one explanation for this subject is that he said that every time he was seeing the gray shape, he was thinking that the rule was changing. So he was <laughs> No, well, no, so it's like an intelligent test. No, no, but this is a, uh, well, well, this is a, uh, you can expect this. Anna, don't this be so bad to your connections now, okay? <laughs> no, no, well, no. I don't think they're powerful to do this. Well, yeah, um, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, of course, I think it was our fault also to, to put a shape that is just great. No, no, no I, I don't think, I think that was a, a good part of the experiment. Yeah, so but I it, think it should be clear, that, or more clear, that the, the, the the shape is well, very scale. Everything is very No, no, okay, well, no, I agree with you. Well, the, the, there are a few things that, well, of course, this is just the initial part of the paradigm. There are a few things that could be fixed yeah, to do a real experiment. So one is that you should you should tell something to the subjects, mm -hmm. uh, not about the task, the true task, but then maybe explain a little bit what the, the task is about, but not revealing the task, just uh, mentioning this. Then also a few, uh, a few uh, let's say, uh, initial trials are needed for helping the, the person familiarize with the situation, mm -hmm. so that's not part of the analysis, of course. Mm -hmm. So, and, oh, sorry, and another, no, sorry. Mm -hmm. another important part here is that, uh, well, of course, you, you, you don't have a clear hypothesis without any comparison on yeah, sure. cost to conditions, but, but still, I, I think I agree with Paul, the paradigm is uh, nice in general, mm -hmm. and uh, Maybe you also have to fine-tune the number of uh, uh, false feedbacks right. and these things yeah, because yeah. Th this, mm -hmm. these are very annoying. And to do this, for instance, I come back to this uh, uh, talk by Ken Coughlin. So w one good thing about these computational models is that you can use them to, to also to figure out how much uncertainty you can put into the system without disrupting everything. Mm -hmm. So if you put too much attention, your computational model will completely fail. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, this is not a proof that humans will fail in the same way, but it can give you an intuition on, on how much uncertainty and false feedback mm -hmm. you can plausibly put there. Right, and that's very nice. But I, I think mm -hmm. as a pilot study, I think it's... That's great, but will you, will you guys finish it now? Sorry. It's really interesting, it's already everything done, so... Okay. Uh, no, but so you already have agreed with each other how you're going to finish it, or...? Not yet. <laughs> So I would encourage you to do that because okay, it's well. extremely <laughs> nice. Okay, very yeah. good. All right, thank, thank you. you. Great. We had to come up with another um, experiment design and what we thought is, okay, since the goal of this uh, project is to go outside in complex and dynamic environment, what we could start focusing about is on the sensory acquisition for uh, such kind of structures, robotic structures. And we based here, on most of the hippocampal formation uh, experiments or models that have been done so far. So, um, just a quick introduction. Uh, most of, for the formation of the place cells, uh, what, what is a common, uh, a common structure for this requirement is that uh, there is some uh, vestibular input or, or some uh, locomotion input that goes uh, straight into the medial and uh, cortex. And this there where the formation of grid cells uh, will happen. Uh, also, there is some sensory input uh, that goes to the lateral internal cortex. And I say here that both of those uh, structures are just one layer up to the hippocampus, so they both project into the hippocampus. One is uh, performing the grid cells, which makes them. Uh, so the grid cells here are just showing what is the motion, the speed vector of the agent in the, in the environment, while the lateral internal uh, cortex is uh, uh, encoding features of the sensory uh, information that the, agents, uh, the agent is acquiring during navigation. And this then uh, where they, they together make a projection to, for the formation of place cells. So 
in that case, uh, we needed to have a grid cell model, and in this case, we just used the Guanella model because it fits really well in this uh, in this scenario. So this uh, model is composed by uh, what is called a twisted torus. So all the nodes are connected to all, and they are folded in such a way that while the robot is performing uh, in the environment, if we just project or we plot the activity of one of these cells within the whole environment, we have what is the, the triangular tessellations over the environment. Here we could play a, a video from Vanilla website to, so, to show the, the other one. So here we can see how is the activity of the, the grid cells uh, being uh, defined according with the speed vector of these robots within the arena. Um, and I think you can assume that if we plot over the, the environment, can you go back? You can assume that if we go, if we plot the activity <laughs> if we plot the activity over the environment here, we are going to get a triangular tessellation, which is going to make like the basis of the map for the definition of the place cells of this agent. So we can go back to the uh, And something that I wanted to say is that most of the models that have been proposed for the place cells formation, they are either a running simulation or running very small environments in very controlled uh, environments. And we realized that that was a problem when we want to go outside in the complex environment because there the noise is huge and it's really difficult to extract some features for a proper uh, place cell uh, formation. So in that case, we had to come up with the idea of how to project or how to define uh, a sensory information acquisition into this uh, into this robot. So for the grid cell, for the place cells formation, in this case, we are not really going into already proposed models, but we are taking a, a self-organizing map that is getting the projection of both uh, leg and make, uh, and then uh, Stefan can just explain a bit how is the the formation of these place cells. Uh, so it's it's super simple. It's a basic uh, self-organizing map, map mechanism, but extended so that the neurons that we use can have um, multimodal receptive fields. So instead of taking of clustering only the visual input or only the grid cell input in this case, we merge both uh, inputs in one self-organizing map and using a what Paul calls an algorithmic trick, uh, we are able to um, invert the, the mapping. So we are able to go from vision, activate the map, and uh, predict the grid cell input. And from grid cells, we activate the map, and we are able to predict uh, what should be the visual input in this uh, particular place field. Uh, and yeah, then the idea is sim simply that uh, the different modalities will activate the same region of the map and through self-organization the place field will emerge from the, from the neural network. Uh, one, one important thing is that in our case, uh, we were using, um, that, that Diogo didn't tell really, is that uh, there have been previous experiments of uh, place cell formation using vision, uh, but most of them rely on markers like fiducials or, or some specific uh, pattern that you put in the environment in order to solve the vision problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, Tim. <laughs> so now it's in its website. Right? <laughs> 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 you no. <laughs> You're not going to sing again, Tim, are you? <laughs> um, so, and in our case, what we decided to do is to use uh, real vision input. Like, we take the camera images, we may apply some filtering on it, but uh, we do not rely on external marker or tracking system. So, 
Okay, so as Stefan just said, one of the experiments which was done was uh, using the visual input. And uh, this previous experiment was um, uh, using the input pixel by pixel. So it was taking an image and inputting every pixel into the map. Uh, now we also did, uh, so we did a comparative study and uh, we also use a way of uh, minimizing the math. The reason being that uh, the fact is that we cannot feed large pictures to a machine, not uh, as much as the human eye can process, the machine can process actually much smaller pictures. Um, so basically we need a way to take larger pictures and extract the relevant information and then <coughs> discard the information that we don't need and then only forward the relevant information to the machine. At the same, at the same time, we need to handle uh, uh, things like uh, uh, noise, for example, because we were speaking before that the experiment is targeted into a real environment where uh, uh, we are not, uh, you know, like uh, on a stall where we don't move, we have all sorts of noise coming in. So, how did we extract <coughs> this relevant information? The technique we use is called histogram of oriented gradients. And uh, before explaining the technique, I'll just tell you where we start from and where we want to go. So we start from an image, image sorry, which is two-dimensional, and we want to derive one single signal, which is one-dimensional, which uh, represents the relevant information in the image. How do we do that? So we take the original image, and we divide it... Uh, can I have the... Thank you. So basically, we divide it in, in uh, squares, which actually are called bins, uh, this is a kind of visual representation because in reality these kind of bins are overlapping to each other. But for uh, visualization we represent it like that. So we, we divide it in bins and then for each bin we compute uh, a lot of uh, uh, like a matrix of gradients and we score it against uh, what is actually represented in the bin. So what do we expect to see? We expect to see some stronger gradients for each bin which uh, represent the main shapes in the, in the picture. And uh, this is actually how it looks like. <coughs> so this is kind of representing the main shapes in the, in, the, in the image. And then still for each square, then, you can see that we don't have only one line representing the gradient, but we have uh, actually nine gradients. So the brightest one are the one with the highest score, the one which win. And the darkest one, which probably you don't even see at all, are the one that uh, you know, don't win. And this comes for, for each uh, block. So this means that for each block in the original histogram of gradient uh, uh, technique, we actually end up with a, a matrix of uh, uh, basically nine pairs of vectors representing the x and the y component for each vector, uh, which uh, if you multiply by the number of blocks in a real image, it's still too much. So we decide to do a slight modification of this algorithm and just select the, the gradient uh, with the highest score for each block. Uh, and this leads to this, uh, uh, basically, sorry, so for example, in this case, we take the, uh, the, the gradient with the highest components, and this leads to uh, two uh, vectors, which are the x and the y component, for all the, each of them representing one, the highest gradient in uh, one of the block of the image. So basically, we pre 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 if we put this sequentially together, we can represent the full image uh, uh, with, a, with a single one-dimensional vector. And uh, now, actually, I will pass it to Ben, which has a real demonstration of how this, uh, <coughs> uh, we implemented it live. Do you need to look this yeah. in? Oh, okay. One second. So, just a second, guys. demonstration that you can get a feeling of what's actually going on. So I connected um, the YAP server, which is running on the iCOP as well, to this camera. And now I'm going to run the HLC descriptor. Oh, it's, can we see it here? Okay. So this is a picture of you guys. Sorry. Well, almost. Um, okay, what you can see here is the histogram of gradients. You see the picture of this camera in the background. 
Then you can see the bins. So like uh, Leonardo explained, actually those bins are overlapping. But um, in order to visualize them, we made them separately so they are next to each other. And you can see for each bin there are nine green lines. And each of these lines corresponds to one of those gradients. And each of them is oriented in a certain angle. You can also see that there's always one blue line, which is the strongest gradient. So, because this data is highly dimensional, we needed to figure out a way to visualize this in a better way. And what we did is the following. Just one second. Okay. You can see a plan upload. So basically, each of those points is one dimension of the input data. So we've got 150 dimensions, and this is the rep representation of the image we sent to the self-organizing map. And you can see that while the image is not really changing, we have a really stable representation of the image. You can see that the strengths of the values are changing, but the pattern, you can clearly see that there's a pattern that's really stable. So if I change the scene a bit, you can see that it slowly converges to another pattern, which is then also really stable. And if you have only small movements, there will be changes, but it will remain really stable. So basically, we are able to extract a representation that is invariant to changes in like rotation and illumination and small movements, and uh, gives a really stable representation of the scene. Yeah, I guess that's, that's it. check how the robot moves around the arena, we just designed some simple and quite accurate local, uh, localization system for robot. We call it the external tracking system. So you can see how the robot moves around the arena in the two-dimensional XY coordinate frame. So for that, we just use the infrared camera placed above robot and three infrared LED markers in the, f in the form of a triangle adjusted to the robot to measure the position and orientation. So <coughs> this Markers positions that uh, are collected using the special uh, software that is uh, ENTS that is used in the in the laboratory and then sent to ICAP using UDP and TR protocols. And what is quite interesting that this this external tracking system is quite robust to driven the position results. Usually, you know, the robot got his own uh, autonomous navigation system, but uh, the results from the from the uh, robot system are quite quite in inaccurate, so that's why we decided to make the external tracking system. And this looks like that. So we got the uh, robot here with these three three uh, three LED diodes that uh, are used for tracking the tracking the robot in the uh, two dimensions x and y. So we can see how the robot moves, and then we can also see, you know, for example compare it with the firing of the grid and the, and the place cells. So, we can run, yeah, we can run the video. Uh, just to add a uh, thing, the main, uh, the main interest of this system was actually initially to be able to benchmark the navigation system, the localization <coughs> system, by comparing the tracked, uh, the, the data from the tracking to the data estimated by the the bio-inspired uh, localization system. We didn't manage to reach this point. We have uh, the data from the tracking system, but we are not able to recompute the XY position from the <coughs> biological system yet. Uh, that's something that we plan to do in a further experiment. But somehow we need a tracking system to be able to benchmark the system. So, as you can see, uh, the robot is actually carrying its own tracking system because uh, uh, if we put it on top of the robot, it would be too high for the camera to read. So, we actually made it carry. Um, we made a random navigation <laughs> module that is. It's, it's, it's using the laser. <laughs> 
it's using the laser action to, to track obstacles and it's uh, it has a, this, this algorithm that is randomly turning and moving straight for an X amount of time and as you can see this is the whole setup that we made That's the tracking system. That's the tracking system. Uh, it's three, mainly three computers, right? In this scenario. The one with the robot, the tracking, and the vision. This is our plan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and we had to cover, for the laser, we had to cover the arena and make it, make boundaries. Well, here you're trying the shaping of the <laughs> from the webcam and see if the system is stable anyway. But now, can you say anything about how how well your your uh, place cells uh, correspond yeah. to position in space? That's the that will be the future. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for instance, you must have seen. Oh yeah, I'm going to show something. Okay. Okay. So basically, by taking uh, by. Taking these three points, we are able to plot as well the, the random navigation of the robot uh, on the experimental arena. Oh no, she's. Okay, so basically, we we managed to run to record the data yesterday afternoon, and we trained. Uh, the place cell uh, this morning because uh, yesterday we had to go to the dinner and it was too late with connection problem and we managed to solve them this morning. So we run actually the third, very first learning experiment this morning. Uh, and so here you can see, uh, so those are twice uh, two different uh, place cells. The one on the left are using the histogram of gradient, the one on the right are using the real, uh, the raw images. Uh, this picture in uh, uh, orange and blue represents the place cells. Uh, you see also the input from the grid cells, so the first line and the second line of pictures are the input from the vision. Uh, so in the case of the histogram of gradient, it's a vector, and in the case of the image, it's a, uh, an image, very compressed, low resolution. Um, but so <coughs> the, the very initial conclusion that we reached, and it's not really a surprise, is that the, in the case of the histogram of gradient, the network converges uh, much faster. Uh, and basically, uh, as the robot moves around the environment, you can see that uh, specific subregions of the map are activated. And uh, well, we should really analyze the data to to prove uh, that the same uh, region in the environment always activates the same uh, region in the in the map. Uh, we can we can see that uh, empirically, <coughs> but we still have to prove it. Uh, and yeah, you can see that the convergence occurred in the in the case of the left because the subregions that are activated are much smaller. While in the case of the right image, you still have. Uh, Quite uh, average selectivity for all the all the places in the environment. So one one interest of this work was to not 
to actually use real images, but uh, to find a way to pre-process them so we can fit them to a neural network in a way that is not too compu computationally expensive. Uh, it's actually quite um, in adequation with biology because the retina doesn't project directly to the to the hippocampus. Uh, so there is some sort of pre-processing going on. Uh, we don't have any evidence that the histogram of gradient could be uh, somehow biologically biased. Uh, plausible. Uh, but it's one way to linearize an image uh, and to compress the information inside it uh, that is somehow appealing uh, for this kind of algorithm. And uh, yeah, of course, we have a lot of things to carry on uh, in order to make this a real experiment that will be uh, able to produce some data for a paper, for example. Uh, so maybe you want to say something about... So, so that's the idea of the future work. So at first we showed that we can select some features that can compress the image. So. Uh, we got some other ideas like, for example, Benjamin is working on the motion exploration using optical flow. That was his idea that he got from his team in... Uh, in